Evening, everyone. It's nighttime. The weekend is upon us, and uh, seems like a good time for a drink. So uh, come join me, if you will. I'd be honored if you would. Um, it's nice to have company, you know? So I've got my tea, but uh, feel free to drink whatever you want. Bring whatever you've got. The important thing is that you relax and uh, that we have fun. Yeah. Anyway, cheers to you. Jesus, too. <clears throat> well, um, I'd like to share something with you all this, this week. Um, a lot going on right now, and uh, specifically there's uh, this virus going around. There's also protests, riots, everything in between, and uh, the media. And all this is just kind of making things interesting. And um, it kind of reminded me of something. And uh, I wanted to share it all with you. Um, yeah, it reminded me of a book. Something I read in a book, anyway. Um, I have it here. George Orwell's 1984, and um, you'll see what I mean, and if you don't, I'll explain it, but um, I'd like to read this uh, section here, and uh, just, I'll show you how it ties in, but I think you'll find it interesting, so, yeah, let's dive right into it. <clears throat> um, now the background of this... Uh, well, the spoiler-free version, basically. So Winston Smith, he's the main character, uh, lives in a dystopian nation. Uh, it's called Oceana. And there's three nations at the time, and they're all warring with each other. And uh, that's about it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, I think that covers it. So, All right, here we go. <clears throat> On the sixth day of hate week, after the processions, the speeches, the shouting, the singing, the banners, the posters, the films, the waxworks, the rolling of drums and squealing of trumpets, the tramp of marching feet, the grinding of the caterpillars of tanks, the roar of massed planes, the booming of guns, after six days of this, when the great orgasm was quivering to its climax, and the general hatred of Eurasia had boiled up into such delirium that if the crown could have got their hands on the 2,000 Eurasian war criminals who were to be publicly hanged on the last day of the proceedings, they would unquestionably have torn them to pieces. At just this moment, it had been announced that Oceana was not, after all, at war with Eurasia. Oceana was at war with East Asia. Eurasia was an ally. There was, of course... No admission that any change had taken place. Merely it became known, with extreme suddenness and everywhere all at once, that East Asia, and not Eurasia, was the enemy. Winston was taking part in a demonstration in one of the central London squares at the moment when it happened. It was night, and the white faces and the scarlet banners were luridly floodlit. The square was packed with several thousand people, including a block of about a thousand schoolchildren in the uniform of the spies. On a scarlet-draped platform, an orator of the inner party, a small lean man with disproportionately long arms and a large bald skull over with, with which a few lank locks straggled, was haranguing the crowd. A little Rumpelstiltskin figure, contorted with hatred, he gripped the neck of the microphone with one hand, while the other, enormous at the end of a bony arm, clawed the air menacingly above his head. His voice, made metallic by the amplifiers, boomed forth an endless catalog of atrocities, massacres, deportations, lootings, rapings, torture of prisoners, bombing of civilians, lying propaganda, unjust aggressions, broken treaties. It was almost impossible to listen to him without first being convinced and then maddened. At every few moments, the fury of the crowd boiled over, and the voice of the speaker was drowned by a wild beast-like roaring that rose uncontrollably from thousands of throats. The most savage yells of all came from the schoolchildren. The speech had been proceeding for perhaps twenty minutes, 
when a messenger hurried onto the platform and a scrap of paper was slipped into the speaker's hand. He unrolled and read it without pausing his speech. Nothing altered in his voice or manner or in the content of what he was saying. But suddenly the names were different. Without words said, a wave of understanding rippled through the crowd. Oceana was at war with East Asia. The next moment there was a tremendous commotion. The banners and posters with which the square was decorated were all wrong. Quite half of them had the wrong faces on them. It was sabotage. The agents of Goldstein had been at work. There was a riotous interlude while protesters, while posters were ripped from the walls, banners torn to shreds and trampled underfoot. The spies performed prodigies of activity in clambering over the rooftops and cutting the streamers that fluttered from the chimneys. But within two or three minutes, it was all over. The orator, still gripping the neck of the microphone, his shoulders hunched forward, his free hand clawing at the air, had gone straight on with his speech. One minute more, and the feral roars of rage were again bursting from the crowd. The hate continued exactly as before, except that the target had been changed. The thing that impressed Winston in looking back was that the speaker had switched from one line to the other, actually in mid-sentence, not only without pause, but without even breaking the syntax. But at the moment, he had other things to preoccupy him. <clears throat> Skip ahead a little bit. There we go. Oceana was at war with East Asia. Oceana had always been at war with East Asia. A large part of the political literature of five years was now completely obsolete. Reports and records of all kinds, newspapers, books, pamphlets, films, soundtracks, photographs, all had to be rectified at lightning speed. Although no directive was ever issued, it was known that the chiefs of the department intended that within one week, no reference to the war with Eurasia or the alliance with East Asia should remain in existence anywhere. Now, what does that have to do with a certain virus and riots and protests in the media? Well, you see, not even a week or two ago, we were in lockdown, right? This virus was going to kill us all. It was going to kill Granny, right? And um, we had to lock down our businesses. We had to lock down the economy. We had to just shut down because this thing was just going to wipe us out. And uh, in fact, if we went outside, you know, we needed to social distance, you know, but if you did, you were selfish. You were a bad person if you didn't stay inside, right? But now look. Now everyone's outside, right? Now if you go, if you don't go outside, you're a bad person. If you don't protest, and if you don't go and make your voice heard, you're a terrible, terrible, horrible, no good, very bad person. <laughs> And it's just astonishing at how quickly it changed. The narrative changed. And the media played a big role in that, honestly. I mean, you just like I said a couple weeks ago, they were saying we're all going to die, right? I think the number was 2 million. One model was saying 2 million people might die. And now what happened? Suddenly everybody's out and about, right? Suddenly, it's not just about us right it's not on us well it wasn't you see if you went outside the, the the thinking was well you could infect somebody and then that somebody would bring it home to grandma and grandma would give it to grandpa and the next thing you know everybody's infected but now you see now the protesters um, they're saying that they're risking their lives. It's just on them if they want to go outside and protest, right? They're not being selfish. They're risking their lives by going out and doing what they perceive is the right thing. And um, don't get me wrong. We do have problems. We do have massive problems with the system and the way things are. 
I'm not going to get into them because that's not the scope of this video and I don't want to make it into that. I just want to hit home the fact that how quickly the narrative changed. And that's what reminded me of 1984. Everybody was hate. Everybody was so full of hate. And they were, you know, like the book said, if they could have gotten their hands on the enemy, they would have just ripped them to shreds. And um, the very next instant, suddenly all their hatred changed on a dime, on a whim. And uh, just from what I've seen, that appears to be the case now. And the funny thing is, most of these protesters um, lean a certain way politically. And uh, Orwell himself was a socialist. And that's what inspired him to write 1984. Um, he fought in the Spanish Civil War. And he saw what they did. And all the mind games they played. And the terrible things that happened. And... He wrote about it, you know? So it's just funny to see this kind of stuff play out in real life. And um, what's even funnier is waking up in the morning and realizing that you live in a dystopian novel. Anyway, <laughs> I uh, just thought you might find that interesting. Like I said, it's, um, <clears throat> it's the media. You know, they're whipping everybody up. One minute it's this, one minute it's that. And um, probably a week from now it'll be something else. So, if I could just uh, say one thing, one piece of advice or something that I'd like to see, it's uh, I'd like to see everybody calm down a little, you know. Sit back, think, reflect. Because that's exactly what we're not seeing. Um, these people aren't thinking. They're not reflecting. They're not questioning the narrative. They're not using reason. They're just chanting slogans and following orders. Honestly. You know, whatever the media tells them to, they're getting whipped up about it. And it's unfortunate. We need more thinking. We need more reason. We need more people to just stop back and question what's going on. You know, what's the big picture? And, uh, well, I wish more people would read books, too. You know, there's other people who have seen stuff like this. And it didn't lead to good places. It led to very dark and terrible times. And I hope that doesn't happen here. Anyway, I'm not going to let it happen here, that's for sure. And with that, I will get off my soapbox, and um, I will wish you a good night, and uh, I hope you have a good week, I hope good things happen to you, I hope good things happen for you. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I wish good things for you, and I hope everything you're trying to achieve or accomplish or anything, I, I really do hope it works out. I know, um, <clears throat> I know it's a struggle. We're all struggling, let's be honest. And, uh, just know that, uh, I got the best wishes for you, you know? Best wishes, and, uh, I'll keep you in my thoughts and prayers the very least so anyway take care and uh good night everyone